Hey everyone, welcome back to the It's My Game podcast. My name is Jade and today I'm very excited to have the beautiful Emily joining us. She's not only going to share her HA recovery journey with us, but she's also started a new venture with a blog all about HA recovery and creating more awareness about it. And I thought we'd just quickly address that first because I think it's wonderful how much HA transforms all of our lives and the more advocates we've got sort of out there sharing their journey and why it's so great to just walk through the mud to get to the other side. Um, So that really, really excites me. So one, thank you for sharing more awareness and and being another voice for the HA community. Um, Tell us a little bit about the blog and your main motivation to start. Well, yeah, the the blog started whilst I was at university. And this is when I was going through HA, but at the time I actually didn't know as such that I was actually going through it. Um, And it sort of started as an interest in, I was um, vegetarian and I was doing recipes and things and I was getting into fitness. And I was just, I've always, I've loved writing and I always wanted a space to kind of just write some things and talk about experiences and specifically the first one I started off with was actually to do with loneliness at university um, and I'm the sort of person where I don't really feel like anything's off limits to talk about and if my experience can help someone then I'd much rather get that message across than just keep it to myself so I posted that one which was all about um, dealing with the fact that university is quite glamorized in the UK and how um, you just you know you can get quite lonely going to a completely different place Um, And then from there, it kind of, I got into writing about different things. And then having been through HA and kind of finally coming out the other side, I was like, I need to now address this and talk about this experience, because obviously this has been my life for the past three years. And it's Mm -hmm. something that I've kind of in passing have spoken to other girls about, and they've kind of potentially sort of um, kind of spoken about things where you're kind of thinking, oh, is this like an eating this like you're kind of hinting at similarities in terms of their experiences and so I kind of wanted to put my experience out there so that I could then help others if they are going through it and don't necessarily know what it is or want to talk about it. Yeah it's really interesting that you bring that up as well because I feel like a whole new world opens up to us once we found out about HA if perhaps we're recovering from it we're starting to witness that our healthy quote-unquote behaviours maybe disordered behaviors and then as you said you start having conversations with friends family or even you know people just sort of passing by that you start talking about something health or fitness and you do start to see little red flags pop up that you never would have noticed previously and that could be around diet culture it could be around exercise routines or even just that um intense focus on body composition or weight or Mm -hmm. perfect nutrients and things Um, another common one which actually come up with a client recently is going to social events and the top priority is how someone looks like whether they've gained weight Mm -hmm. they've lost weight or if they're just the same but sometimes that's such a high point of conversation and again in the past might not have ever noticed it you might have joined in on the conversation you might have been the focus of the conversation and it was all sort of like fun and didn't really mean anything and then you go through this journey and you start to go oh my goodness like this is happening everywhere and just as I was the people I'm talking to don't even witness what's going on right now um so I love that you've also noticed that and you know, to a degree, the blog's being a powerhouse for sort of shifting that um, that reality and hopefully creating more awareness where people start to go, oh, hang on, maybe this isn't quite right. And maybe we do need to reflect on what we're saying and shift the narrative a little bit. Um, but I guess leading into your HA recovery side of things, do you want to start us off with what life was like when HA kicked in? Um, did you care about losing your period? and um yeah the ins and outs of all of it yeah so I mine started because of I put on a bit of weight at university and I'd been very privileged growing up I was not I wasn't didn't have any weight issues essentially and so I didn't understand diet culture because I'd never had to go through had to go, go through it before so for me it was kind of this completely new thing where oh maybe I should lose weight maybe I need to go on a diet and I had no idea what I was doing. I literally, I had, I think I'd been given a Fitbit for Christmas and I literally went on the app and it said about calories and I was like, okay, I'll just pluck a random number out of the air. I had no idea what a calorie even was until that day. 
um, which is again a really nice place to be having gone through childhood not even knowing that um, but yeah so then I, I literally just plucked out a thousand calories out of the, out of the air mm. which is so minimal um, not knowing at all what that actually meant and kind of just stuck with it I, I kind of I didn't I wasn't to start with I wasn't completely focused on tracking and things I was kind of just oh I'll just eat a bit healthier and kind of move more it was always the eat less move more like that was the kind of diet culture thing that I kept hearing um and so that's what I did and it kind of I, I'd always been into the gym but I'd never been into I'd never got obsessed with it I was very kind of oh it oh, doesn't matter if I miss a day whereas now it became obsessive because I had a goal and that goal was mm. to lose weight um and so it kind of progressed over the year and by the end of so it was, this was 2017 to 2018 so by the end of 2018 I was tracking my calories completely um I was walking an hour to my campus for my university going to the gym for like an hour and then I'd also walk back as well and it was a very I was in Cornwall and it's really hilly there so there's a lot of hills but um I, I you know I was so I wasn't eating enough at all to fuel for these workouts, but I was so, I need to lose weight. Um, and it was, you know, it was starting to come off and then I, you know, that would keep the cycle going because you're starting to get your confidence back because I felt more like myself and I was feeling a bit more extroverted because I felt a bit more confident in how I looked. Um, and so that kind of perpetuated it. And at this point I was tracking completely. And I remember there was one day where I um, I'd accidentally double tracked so I'd put my pudding that I'd had in or my dessert whatever um, I'd put that in twice and I hadn't realized this so I thought I'd gone over my calories when actually I was completely under and I remember going to bed being so hungry thinking why am I hungry like I've eaten you know it mm -hmm. says according to the app and I think looking back you realize how distorted your view on food was if you were based you weren't thinking about how hungry you were you were basing everything off what your app was telling you as to whether you'd eaten enough or not and at this point I was literally going to bed uh reading recipe books before bed mm. as like my bedtime read and it's like fair enough if you're trying to be a chef but that I wasn't <laughs> you know I was just so obsessed with food that you know your mind just wants to think about it all the time um so it wasn't until I went home for Christmas I then lost my periods for three months and I at that point was quite oh yeah maybe um maybe this is like a, a a warning a sign you know a signal that something's not right in my body um but I'd I had lost my period one month before in my life but that was because of stress of moving to uni so mm -hmm. to start with I was kind of like the first month I lost it I didn't really think into it and then by the third month I was a bit hmm my app says it's been like three well not there's been like um 100 days or whatever it was since mm -hmm. having my last period and it was a bit of a this isn't normal um and so I looked online about losing periods and I was like okay this is what's happening I'll eat more and I'll continue to work out and hopefully you know if I just gradually increase it'll but unfortunately for me because my hormones were so out of whack at that point um as soon as I started eating normally again I would just put on loads of weight and that just when you're in that mindset of you're so fi fixated on losing weight or being a certain particular like body type or whatever um you're just you're not you're not thinking about the health of it you're thinking about how you look and so unfortunately for me once I'd started to put on weight again yes I did get regain my periods uh but nobody tells you about when you regain your periods um how heavy and ridiculous the symptoms can be because obviously it's been so long since you've last had them um and so all of that happened and I felt really insecure again and I went straight back to nope I'm gonna lose the weight again because I'd remembered how confident I'd been feeling and despite having lost my periods I wanted that confident feeling again um so yeah I kind of I then started instead of the gym I started running and so I was running every day and I, I actually gone vegan at this point because I thought that's a way to cut out calories um and so yeah it kind of then spiraled into another few months of ridiculous over exercising under eating um and then by christmas that year i'd um i'd got 
hormonal acne all over my um, chin. And I, again, lost my periods for three months. I seemed to do everything in threes. Um, but it was actually the acne that was what made me change my mind about this because I'd already, you know, I'd already had the, I'd become thin again and then I was happy and I'd lost my period. So I was kind of okay with doing that again. But once I got the acne, that it was really, it was really painful. And I tried loads of creams and just nothing worked. And it was like, no, this is, this is because of my actual physical health. And that's a, another warning sign. Um, and so it was because of that, I decided, right, I have to just end this cycle because I know I've become pretty orthorexic in terms of like mm. really had to be healthy. Um, again, it wasn't sustainable to be running every single day. And some days I actually ran, I think one day I ran up to 14 K so 14 kilometers. Um, mm. and I didn't feel it at all. I literally I came back and I would, I refused to have a snack or anything. I didn't eat until like 9 PM that night. And I remember being so hungry, but thinking, no, it's worth it because, you know, you need to keep it off. And it's just, you're so, I I just can't, I don't know how I functioned. I did a degree and got, you know, I got my uh, degree and it was, I don't know how I did that whilst I was so fixated on everything else that was going on. You know, you have a conversation with someone and my mind's just thinking, oh, they're they're thin. Like, I wonder what they're eating. Mm. And I wonder what their exercise routine is. You're not like you're not there you're you're in your head and it's just like I just can't believe looking back that it got to that point um because growing up I'd always been absolutely fine with food I'd never had any issues and I'm relatively active so I never thought it could get to that point um but yeah so luckily for me actually uh, we had the pandemic and I ended up coming home from university uh, so I couldn't go to the gym and I did continue running because my mum runs, but I couldn't eat quite as less because obviously my parents would see and be a bit concerned. So I was eating a little bit more normally because I was eating meals with them. And actually I sustained a foot injury and then I couldn't run. So I just said, okay, I've not got my periods. Let's try for not exercise as hard as that was. Obviously it's a really hard uh, mentality to battle, but I tried it and I did get my period back after a month of resting, which was pretty quick, but I'd only ever lost them at three months at a time. So regardless of the fact I only lost them six months in total, it still took me a whole three years to actually get out of this cycle um, totally. Um, So I got my periods back. Then I went and lived in Spain for three and a half months just because the pandemic and I was just, I wanted to go and do something. And I kind of old habits crept back a little bit. I wanted to go swimming. I was a little bit, oh. And actually one of the, what kind of breaks my heart a little bit is one of the main reasons I went to Spain as well as obviously I grew up wanting to go and live there my whole life. But one of the main factors was, I know I'm going to put on weight from not exercising. Why don't I go and live somewhere else? So the people that I care about don't see me Mm. gaining weight. And it was, you know, it's all driven from insecurity. And then when I came back from Spain, after kind of a few months of having periods, but the symptoms were awful and I was still swimming way too much and not fueling. I, at this point as well, I just, I was having, I had almost like a year of insomnia, just not sleeping and my heart would be crazy at night. Um, I came back and I was just fed up. I was, I'd, I'd still put on weight because I wasn't obviously exercising and I was just so, over it so I came home and actually I just decided to completely give up with exercise and just go on walks and that was it um because we were still in a lockdown uh, so a national lockdown at home and it was just I'm not seeing anyone it's fine um unfortunately I pushed a lot of people away at this point because of how insecure I was uh, and so it's like a, it's a time I really regret because I was so insecure I was just I'm not seeing anyone um but I kind of you know, if things have been different, I think my life would be very different now. But no, it's um, it's just it's really hard to kind of look back and think about how insecure you were in terms of just you. I felt so negatively about myself that I didn't want other people to see me because I thought they wouldn't like me if they saw me. And it's just it's just it just shows how deeply rooted all of these negative thoughts were in my head. And yeah, but I did get my periods back, and I 
continued to not exercise and then in September 2021 so only the September just gone I started the gym again and I'd fixed my food issues by then and I because I understood what I had to eat normally in a day and I was fueling it and I was making sure I'd have a protein shake every time like despite what I was eating that day always just to have had something after my workout and now I'm kind of in a position where I'm back to just how I was in childhood you know eating what I want and not caring and I'm socializing and I've got my life back and I can still do what I enjoy which is exercise but it's nowhere near as, obs- as obsessive as it was so yeah that's a that's a really long-winded way of just basically explaining my entire journey with HA. So. No it was a beautiful way of explaining your journey because you have a few um, interesting like areas of your journey with the even just the you lost it for three months then you got it back then you lost it for three then you got it back um because one there's that confidence that your body so wanted to have that cycle like yeah. even the way how quickly it sort of responded as soon as you said okay I'll rest and then it's like oh great thanks and then mm-hmm. you leveled up a bit and then it's gone oh yeah not going to do that okay I'll rest and then it's sort of come back in again but even how you brought to the surface how insecure we are and how withdrawn we can become and I I did very very similar things with my HA recovery I left my career and hid away from many, many friends. And same as you, I, I look back and I regret it so much. Not necessarily the career change, because I think I needed that something no, refreshing, no. but the friendships went 100%. But yeah. it's one of those things you don't even realise how withdrawn you are until you start feeling better. And you're like, oh, why, why am I not talking to these people? Why did I? And it was, And it's not like you aggressively in relationships. You kind of just slowly kind of drift away behind the curtain um so it's not as though you can't heal the relationships like for me it was literally just send some messages out and people were happy to catch up but I even Mm -hmm. felt at that point I I still needed to be like oh I look a little bit different because I wasn't Mm -hmm. completely there and I remember every single response was like oh what do you what do you mean but I felt like I needed this sign like this flashy sign to be like look just so you know I'm not what I was blah, 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 blah. And consistently every single person was like, you look great. You look happy. You look like, Mm -hmm. and even if they didn't say that it was literally a, yeah, but what have you been up to? Like they dismissed it Mm -hmm. because they don't care. But as you would relate to in the moment, it's like, oh my gosh, what if they don't like me anymore? What if they question about what I've been doing and why I'm not looking after myself, despite looking after myself more than ever before, um, but there was that fear of even first um, contact again after having some form of a delay because, as you said, it was kind of empowering to not be in the focus so you could heal and gain a little bit of weight. But then mm-hmm. at some point you need to return back to life and society and it either way it can be a bit tricky. But I'd love to know what your experience was like when whether it was because lockdowns ended or whether it was because you just felt confident enough to bring your friends back in or what was that period like for you hard and I can't can't I can I relate so much to what you're saying about feeling like you need to justify how you look to everyone because I at at this point was so I'd um started talking to someone that I was kind of thinking that a relationship might form and I was you know I kept saying to him that look I've, I've, I've put on weight like just kind of keep on like because I'm not I don't look how I used to look when you last saw me and like all of that and it's just even to my best friends that I you know I knew weren't gonna you know it's a bit the thing I had was it was a bit different with a guy because for me it's a, you know it's a bit more pressure they they actually can walk away and and mm. I, it, I was actually the one to walk away because I was like no I don't want you to see me and that's that's what I mean it's like you, you took it completely took over that you're just so insecure that you push people away yourself because you'd rather they didn't realize that they didn't like you but so with my friends it was kind of a every single time I'd be like but you know I've put on weight or um I look a bit yeah like you said like I look a bit different or I don't look like how I used to look and I think for me the main factor was when I came back from Spain because I'd had that safe space away then coming straight back and going straight back into the oh now now I need to actually go and meet people but I look so different there was almost like um a bigger difference because you've got your before Spain and then after Spain almost and like it kind of Mm -hmm. it showed the contrast more 
Um, and I didn't want people thinking I'd, you know, gone away to Spain and just like eaten loads. And, you know, you have loads of negative like connotations around food in that sense when you're in that mentality. But I just had to kind of, there was a point I had about four months where I just walk, went on walks by myself and I just got so fed up. One, because we were also in a lockdown for most of that time. But I was just so fed up of not seeing people. I was so fed up of hiding myself away and being ashamed of myself when, you know, I'm still myself. I just, and I was starting to get my personality back because I was losing the focus on the food and stuff. And so eventually, after my mum as well, persuading me to be like, go and see your friends, please. <laughs> um, I eventually went out. And once you see that one friend, you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. And like you say, they don't, they're not thinking about your weight. You're thinking about it. And, you know, maybe, maybe they might think, oh, she does look different, but they're not, one they're not going to say that to you but also you know they're not there to, they're there to enjoy your company and I think so I kind of gradually I met up with my best friend and then I met up with a few more friends and then gradually felt a bit more confident and then yeah I'd got to sort of four months in and I was just I'm so I just wanted to do stuff and get out there again and I was just so bored of um kind of waiting for the opportunity when I could just make it myself and not be ashamed um so yeah I kind of I just gradually socialized a bit more I ended up um meeting a guy for drinks and then that gave me confidence because he was really nice and he didn't you know turn me away and so then that uh, that escalated into a relationship and he was amazing you know he I, I can't thank him enough because he was the one that really helped me with my food you know he would had such a healthy relationship with food he'd grown up in a sporty family where um, they understood that you need to eat more and so he was the one that encouraged me to have a protein shake after the gym and just even if that's all it is like just just do that for now and then we'll build up on it um so that really helped me but just in general I think as well I started a teacher training course and I was in front of kids all the time and the kids just see you for who you are you know they're not thinking about anything about how you look and actually most of the time they were actually really nice um but yeah I, I think you start to value yourself a bit more when you're viewing yourself in the eyes of others but not in respect to how you look but more so in what you can offer for those people and what you bring to their to the relationship and I think as I started to value myself more for my personality and the things that I can offer people and you know what I was doing with my job it started to just become more natural and then I actually did get to a point where I was feeling like I could go to the gym again and then it, everything kind of just fell back into place but I feel like I actually really needed that time to actually I only need I need to value myself and my personality more because now I you know I, I feel so much better about myself as a whole it's not just all about you know your physical self it's just so much more you know it's, and it's in that sense I was really grateful that I've been through it all because I've come out actually feeling so much better about myself as a person because of it. Yeah, when you talk about the self-worth element and self-confidence, it's such a big part of the HR recovery journey and that rediscovery that at some point in time, we actually do feel confident because of our character. We do feel confident because of what we bring to the table, whether we're funny, we're trustworthy, we're, we're loyal, we're quirky, like whatever springs to mind. And previously that had been what made you want to make friends and talk to new people and connect and communicate and then somewhere along the path we start to think that our value to the world is our physique or our training routine or our diet and it I can't help but think it tends to be because we start to get so many comments on it that we yeah. start to believe that well that's why they now value because that's a big point of conversation when really it's a point of conversation because humans like to discuss change or like witness it or notice it or especially weight loss it's like people get really curious on what you're doing how you're doing it because there's mm -hmm. such there's pretty there's a general obsession in society about it whether people act yeah, on it or not true. even someone who's never had an interest in dieting a gym membership running you still find they are happy to have a conversation about weight loss like it's a really mm -hmm weird thing for that matter like everyone wants a piece of it or most do um but then within that whirlwind we start to be like oh well this is where our worth is coming from it's like it's my discipline it's my motivation and there that's such a big difference from emotionally what you bring to people's lives so how when you started to make those connections again I love that 
you know, that's something that you started to witness. It's like, it's not actually my determination or motivation or my rules that make people happy when I see them. It's the joy, the, the laughter, the humor, the, the loyalty, the friendship, the trustworthiness that actually makes you connect with people and have a really good time. And even how you mentioned the influence of the, the guy that you were dating, we can absolutely use people in our lives as emotional anchors to heal our relationship with food, especially if you sort of respect how they care for their body it can be a lot easier to be like, I'm going to copy what they do in a way that feels more suitable to me. So obviously if you're dating him, he's heavy into training, his meals are still going to be very different to what yours are. Though you can be like, oh, well, he's having X, Y, Z things on a plate. I can have the same, but whatever suits me. Um, And sometimes that can be more appealing than all those set rules as well. It's like, well, I trust they know stuff. Perhaps it's, they look fit. They look healthy you can see how comfortable and confident they are around food and you go, oh, well, they must be onto something here. Like Mm -hmm. what's the secret? And the beautiful thing is if you surround yourself with people with those sorts of attitudes, it does rub off and pretty quickly too. Did you find that with the the guy you were dating? It's like maybe at the start you're like, oh, I'd never do that. Oh, not sure about this. But you're also Mm -hmm. watching him train. You're watching him be happy, spontaneous, fun. And then you start going, well, he's got the best of both worlds. Like, surely I can too. And that yeah. curiosity sparks and it kind of gets exciting to explore, well, what happens if I was a bit more playful with these things? Mm. What would life be like? Did you have a similar experience? Yeah, so it, it, it was pretty much, I think he noticed a lot about my eating as well but I kind of because of all the justification I'd already told him you know I'd already gone through all of that he knew my life story um but I I wanted he knew that I wanted to obviously get back to how I'd been you know previously when I because I, 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 I'd known eating normally before I because it had only been those that what time when I'd gone to university that, that it had happened so I knew I knew what it was like to eat normally and like you say yeah just seeing them you know if it was something I can't I can't really remember what my fear foods were anymore but I had you know a few fear foods where if he ate them I'd just be like oh he's not getting really anxious about the fact he's just eating that right now why why is that why can't maybe I can have a go at doing that I think one of my rules was kind of like I don't want to eat the same thing in the same day so if it's something unhealthy I wouldn't eat it twice and he was like "Mm." well if it's all you've got then eat it and it's kind of you just naturally learn behaviors off other people like you said and socializing and going out and seeing other people just really not caring about the fact they've had however many drinks or however many or they've suddenly because they've had a few drinks now they're having chips and for me I would always calculate what I was going to have and it's it's nice to just let that go and actually enjoy yourself instead of being so up here in your head about everything the whole time so yeah it was but yeah it it was relatively quick that I kind of because I'd already worked on a few of my eating issues beforehand before meeting him it kind of just kept it going and yeah and did you find that once you started to feel better even though your body had changed a little bit so your confidence I'm just going to say is different because we're just a little bit uncertain about social events, let's say. But did you find that because you were feeling well and that sort of hunger chatter silenced or at least quietened down, that you were able to naturally be so much more present and enjoy yourself in social events because it wasn't like, you know, you and I are talking right now, but even though we're Mm -hmm. talking, there's like a second conversation about, yeah, but when's lunch? What did you have for breakfast? Mm -hmm. you shouldn't have had that extra bite what are you going to do later hey your friend just messaged for lunch what are you going to say because you didn't plan to go out for lunch and you know we could still have a really great conversation but with that chatter going on and quite intense sometime it's so different to what you and I are experiencing right now where all I'm hearing is you right and all I'm thinking is about is what you're sharing with me and as a result of that it's so much more enjoyable did you notice that difference once it sort of occurred that you're like oh wow this is actually really relaxing being here talking to my friends yeah. I'm not having two conversations at once absolutely it's I mean it's little things like um 
just being at a dinner with friends you're not thinking oh what have they ordered oh maybe I should have got that because they're you know whatever they are worth but and you're so right in the fact that you can be having a conversation with someone but you're thinking oh I haven't eaten or oh I shouldn't have eaten like you're thinking about your breakfast or you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or for me I tend to what I tended to do was project what I thought they did so if I was talking to someone I'd be like I wonder what they eat like it's just the weirdest Mm. like why is that coming into my head like I should be concentrating on what they're saying and you know to an extent I am but you're so right there was always this kind of second voice in your head that's kind of talking about the food aspect of things and I think it's because you're so deprived of food so hungry your brain is huge hunger cue for anyone listening it's a hunger cue (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is why once we get to the tail end of this we start going oh well my head's quiet and it could be busy because of other things like work and like some part of that is normal 100 but if you've got like a loud voice or even just a constant one or an annoying one for that matter it's Mm -hmm. absolutely a sign that you're you're hungry you need to be consuming more yeah absolutely and I I found I used to watch loads of YouTube videos um of people eating like 10,000 calorie challenges I used to love those but I, I you know that would never appeal to me I'd never do it but I own and I don't watch those anymore I, they, I don't like those anymore but I only watch them because it satisfied my mental hunger because if I could see people eating it made me feel like I'd eaten also if you see people eat a big amount and they're in a healthy state you're thinking oh well if they can eat that much then it's okay for me to eat this apple which is mm-hmm. just ridiculous because you know you're comparing it to the slightest thing um, but yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people, and I, I didn't obviously understand it before going through HA, but that obviously there is a second voice that is, you're constantly elsewhere. And yes, of course you kind of, you might have, oh, did I lock the car or oh, did I leave the oven on? Like that happens, but it is consistently food talk or like gym talk. It's either, it's one of those or it's weight or whatever it is, but it's constantly in your head and or even if someone brings up periods and I'm like, um, oh, are you on the pill? Are you like, do you have regular periods if you're working out? Like, I'm just, at the time, I kind of wanted to know if anyone else was going through the same thing. Um, but it kind of, it's just not, it's just not spoken about. And so I didn't actually understand any of that until obviously going through it. Yeah. And I guess what were your biggest changes when it comes to your mindset around food? Because obviously you had some pretty aggressive calorie mm-hmm. counting um, you sort of lent on veganism as a way to consume lower yeah. calories rather than, you know, for nutritional content and things like that. But mm-hmm. what was some, and obviously moving back home, you said you were suddenly, you were eating meals cooked by your parents. So that kind of mm-hmm. helped level up on the, you know, not being so rigid with things and not being able to perhaps do perfect calculations because perhaps they were serving up your dinner instead of you weighing and things. Yeah. But what what did you find most helpful when it come to, overcoming some of the food fears perhaps being more calm when eating with friends and family say at a restaurant um, or even just welcoming in more frequent meals post-workout shake Um, Mm -hmm. what helped you move the marker the most I'd say well first of all delete the calorie counting apps that was the main thing for me was getting rid of the numbers because everything was numbers to me and it was just the mindset that you've got you've got to eat a specific amount or you or for me you know I'd be dancing in my bedroom if I eat if I'd eaten over it mm-hmm. and it's like you know I love dancing in my bedroom but that was for all the wrong reasons yeah um but it yeah so deleting carry app, app tracking apps was the main one um but also just I don't know just experiencing other people eat but not in an obsessive way in a so when I went to Spain you know I was surrounded I was living with um three other three kids because I was an au pair and I was looking after them and you know they would just eat the most like random diets they'd just go you know I had a 13 year old who'd just go to the cupboard and just get some cereal and just start eating from the box and you just think you're kind of looking at them like wow that's that's freedom imagine having that and then it's like but I can do that and it's really slow but you kind of have to just talk yourself out of it and it's 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 not easy to do because you 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 know if you've got so many rules, it's so hard to kind of get rid of them all at once. So I would say kind of work on at least one at a time, and maybe kind of work 
gradually you just it is a gradual process it's not something you can just kind of oh whatever I'll just let's just eat loads what or just let go of because then you have the guilt you can't do the extremes you have to just slowly kind of work it out and work work with what but works best for you yeah I I couldn't agree with you more on the food front it's like you just need consistency like and perseverance that just tip away the smallest of things every single day even if on one day your best is having an extra bite of something like if that's your best then it's better than doing all the strict rules for that day and having that consciousness of when something becomes like when it's not challenging anymore because at the very start say having a bite of a biscuit would have been like oh my goodness I can't believe I'm doing this but then say a week later you're having a bite of a biscuit and it means nothing. That's like, that's awesome. That's really good. But that also means it's a great time to choose, well, what am I looking at next? What can I explore? What can I be curious about? Because we can become stagnant with our success as well, where it's like, oh, well, I feel good about that now. And it's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. But we need to keep that momentum going and not get stuck at just that level that we accomplish. Because as, yeah. as you said, there's so many levels and layers and there's also so many opportunities to explore. Like I love encouraging women to invite it in with curiosity. Like what do things taste like? What's it like to share with friends or to share with family? Or And it's okay to not like things that you try. And if you don't like it, well, you, you don't eat the rest of it. All of that's okay. Yeah. That's just welcoming in those new experiences. Before we sort of close things up, because I just, you've listed two key things that I know those listening will find really interesting. And one of them would definitely be the journey with your acne and how it was presenting itself, how it cleared up with your HA recovery or sort of protocols that you used. And also um, you had the reduction in exercise, but when you chose to add it back in, what it looks like now, did you do it gradually, um, that whole realm? Yeah, no, perfect. Um, so the acne, oof, I, like I said, I tried loads of creams thinking, ah, you know, if it, yeah, because I think I went to the doctors and generally they would just prescribe you with, well, oh, just use this for cream or whatever. And I tried it and it just wasn't going and I knew it was an internal thing. You know, you have a gut feeling, you're like, well, it's obviously related to the hormone issues. Um, for me, it was it was just a case of once I'd committed to getting my periods back and slowing down or just completely stopping the exercise to be honest and fueling myself again I then started to sleep a little bit my sleep took a long time to restore that was the longest thing but um and still I still have some sleep that's nice but so does everyone but um yeah the it was just over time it just went and I forgot I when I went to Spain my acne cleared up quite a lot and that was because I'd had about probably a period of about six months of just you know fueling properly and stopping and eventually it just cleared up because you know I I tried all of the different face washes everything um but it was just once you fix the hormonal issue and the internal problems everything else slowly starts to fall into place so for the acne it did and you know we some we all get you know hormonal acne from time to time especially when we're due on our periods or whatever but for me it was it just slowly did disappear and yes there was some scarring for a while but I just had to live with that you know it was kind of a I know it will go eventually and it has so it's sort of a you just have to persevere and kind of hold on to the hope that you know it will fix itself along with everything else fixing itself internally um but yeah no that was one of the main signs for me to kind of I had I had to just stop because it was so itchy and painful and I, also that was you know that affected my confidence as well and can I ask with the breakouts were they more like blackheads or were you getting like cystic acne or because you said it was yeah, sort of like all cyst- around the jawline which is really common for mm-hmm. hormonal imbalance um and you mentioned that they were quite sore so did you find that a lot of them didn't even have heads it was just like all that inflammation under the skin or what was it what was it like for it you it was yeah it was kind of all of them I'd say blackheads was the probably the least common it was mostly just you know your normal spots but the thing I used to find which was really bizarre was like you've just said and in, you're inflamed I used to suddenly get almost rashy um on my chin and I'd have to like stick my head out of a window because it was just so hot and it was like I was having some sort of hot flush but I just it would get so itchy that I'd have to just actually put some cool, cool air on it and 
I must have looked really weird sticking my head out of a window but it was like because water wouldn't work because then it gets dry and so yeah. you yeah I think it, it was mostly like cystic and just just the normal the average kind of spots but yeah no it wasn't pleasant yeah there was actually a post on Instagram I don't follow much skin influencer stuff in any way shape or form though I do it I did end up with this one lady on there I think she's the skin queen or something and um they she actually did a post about low energy availability and acne oh, yeah. and because a lot of the the HA work I sort of invest my time in is more like period focused rather than skin like I know skin can obviously be a part of it but the way the post was structured was so much about you know not eating enough training too much very much how you'd read a HA post like terminology, almost word for word. And she went into like cystic acne. And as soon as you start fueling properly, your skin's going to recover, the inflammation's yeah. going to settle. And I found it so interesting that there's actually a whole other world of low energy availability that's starting to come to the surface, which I also think is really powerful too, because as you would have um, read about as well, or maybe experienced with some of your girlfriends, is that some women are still under fueling, overtraining, but they keep their cycle. Or they miss one every couple of months, but it's not enough for them to see a red flag and it's not enough for a doctor to pick up a red flag. But perhaps their skin getting out of whack might be enough for them to go, oh, hang on, maybe I can do better than this. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that's, that's another area of HA where you might feel the same that I'm really grateful for. Like I'm so glad I actually lost my period because it made me reconsider these things. If my period was consistent and I stayed ovulating, I would have I wouldn't have had a motivation to change. No. I would have just been like, yeah, I'm, I'm running on cortisol, but I love it because I didn't know any better. <laughs> I had no comparison mm. to how I could feel or would feel. Um, so it's really interesting that now skin is starting to be brought into it as well because it's such a common common thing too. Now, as for your training, what happened there? So yeah. you said that you've had cycles where you were you were in the gym and then you sort of took a step back, but then you focused on running and then you took a step back and then you focused on swimming. So there sort of is that all or nothing in the, yeah. the sport of choice or exercise movement of choice, but then you ended up walking. Um, mm-hmm. You have reintroduced the gym now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What does that look like for you? How did it begin? So, yeah, so it was very much all or nothing for whilst I was going through HA. And then when I decided... To completely stop exercising back in the pandemic I was walking probably too much because at the, you know you're still in that mental state you're still in that fitness obsessed so I'd still be walking for like an hour just because I'm kind of oh I still need to exercise but slowly but surely I think as well being exposed to your friends kind of being like oh I, did, I literally didn't leave my bed today and you're like what oh, how <laughs> Um, you kind of you learn to kind of just gradually let go of it and then I got so luckily for me I got so caught up in my teacher training that you know I was moving because I was walking around classrooms I was walking around the school and so I just I was so okay with not doing the exercise and actually I remember I was on holiday and I went um, I went swimming in the sea and when I, I went to sleep and I actually fell asleep because for me whenever I did exercise my heart would be going crazy and I, I had insomnia I couldn't sleep that it was just there's no doubt about it if I'd done any exercise I wasn't sleeping and I woke up the next morning and I thought oh I, we did loads of walking yesterday and I went swimming and I slept and it was just this mm-hmm. massive like wow <laughs> I can sleep again and so it was I, I didn't suddenly start you know going back into it after that I just noticed that it was obviously working so I carried on with that mentality of you know I'm not exercising I'm not going to start my gym membership until I feel ready um but you know maybe I can walk a bit more or whatever um but yeah like I said I got carried away with the whole teaching thing and then September I kind of said I'll give it a try you know I'll, I'll go to the gym and I'll see if I can sleep because I would measure mine off whether I could sleep or not um and for the first few times I think it was kind of I had a bit of a disturbed night or I would be you know it was a really regular thing for me to be going downstairs at 3 a.m and eating because I'd wake up starving suddenly Mm. um and that was something I experienced throughout the entire journey like you you'd get suddenly really hungry at night um but yeah so once I'd realized that I needed to eat more I'd maybe go to the gym and eat a, a lot but not like 
not in an unhealthy way but just enough you know making sure I was I feel, feeling it yeah. and then I'd sleep and it would be kind of like oh so here's this is the pattern right you know you need to eat enough to fuel it and I'd only go like I started once a week and just kind of tried it out and then left it for two weeks to make sure I got my period got my period and then thought oh okay the next month okay I'll go once for the first week then maybe so maybe I'll go three times that month and it gradually kind of increased and to be honest I've I've only been going to the gym when it became more regular it was two twice a week um but always fueled and then now it's you know sometimes I'm only going twice a month because if I if I'm too tired if I'm too busy I won't go and that's you know the beauty of it now is that it's become a kind of it's not my life it's it's something that I can you know if I'm coming back from work and I fancy it then I'll do it but if I'm too tired I won't go and that's something that I've really learned is just listening to your body but yeah it was a very very slow and gradual process and like I said I'm not I'm nowhere near back to and I don't want to I don't want to be back to the five days a week of going to the gym as much as I enjoy weight training and all of that I'm happy with an upper body day and a lower body day and that's that's me for the week and to be honest if that doesn't happen it's okay I'll just do one full body or if it doesn't happen at all that week it's fine and actually what I found works for me is the week before I'm due my period I won't I won't go at all one because I seem to have more disrupt sleep if I was if I was to go but just because you know your psych your you know your natural cycle doesn't require you to be moving that much before your period you need that extra energy to fuel your actual you know your hormones and everything so yeah I've kind of I've kind of completely changed the structure of my um training because it's kind of to do with my menstrual cycle now so I kind of with the flow of the menstrual cycle I kind of go to the gym you know first period I I forgot this is the thing I'm so far from thinking about periods now that I've kind of I've even forgotten the names of oh, it's luteal luteal phase and what's the other one there follicular uh, follicular yes um which one's is follicular first or second Sec- second second yeah I think so but regardless wh- whichever one you'll have more energy and I'll always go to the gym in that one and then when you're in your phase where you're kind of just coming on to your period or you're kind of you've ovulated I won't I won't you know I'm not I'm not thinking about it I'm not going no follicular's so, first yeah and then luteals yeah, I always I know lots about the hormonal fluctuations <laughs> and it's the one thing I'm always yeah, like always no it's this up. way and then I overcorrect it because I normally get it wrong mm-hmm. but now I overcorrect yeah. it too much I'm like oh now I get it wrong so I overcorrect it and I don't <laughs> need to correct it anymore that's why as soon as you said I'm like I have to google this I need to learn this mm. um yeah, but like, I think it's. I love hearing that from you though, because there's so much freedom in the fact that you're like, oh wait, I, I can't even think about periods because I just haven't done it for so long, and yeah. and that's not a lack of care. That's actually confidence. It's like I know that the pattern or the rhythm. I'm gonna call it a rhythm that you've got right now because mm-hmm. you kind of ebb and flow works for you so you don't have mm-hmm. to fixate on when things are happening how often they're happening why they're happening you can just go no well my period's going to show up day whatever round about there and it's going to last x amount and then I'm just going to go through the cycle again um, and I do wonder do you actually enjoy the flexibility you've got around training like the way you describe sometimes I might go twice a week sometimes I might not go at all but it's a very sort of like I'm going to just say like a flimsy thought. It's very in the moment. What do I feel like versus I went two times last week. I've only gone once this week. Like, God, like there's such a different emotional mm-hmm. response to, oh, I'm just doing what suits me and comparing to the last week, the week before, the month before. Um, yeah. Do you kind of, because it, it's still quite fresh for you adding training back in. So I wondered, you still sort of have that reflection of, oh, it's so nice to be able to say no, or it's so nice to be able to say yes um but it's so like I mean, fun yeah no, li- literally last week I was I went to the gym and I was feeling a bit tired and actually I was feeling a bit hungry and I just remember thinking okay oh and one of my friends who's into fitness she she uses this expression um she says uh, you're just saying hello to your muscles and I loved it and I just I always say that so if I'm feeling tired I'm not going to go out and just, this is going to be the best session ever. It's just a, I'll just say hello to my muscles, you know, just wake them up a bit or whatever. But it, it's so freeing now, just kind of, even if you go to the gym, there have been times where I've gone, I've come, so I've come from teaching. 
I've sat in the car park and I thought I can't I don't have the energy and I'll drive home and I've had to talk myself you know to start with I had to talk myself out of it you'll sort of be like no that this is okay you're allowed to do this and now it's become oh no I'm not fussed and it's I don't have that mental argument with myself you don't need to talk yourself through it yeah exactly yeah or I don't have to justify it so at the time I'd probably justify it by saying to someone or oh I'm not going to go to the gym today before or I'd come home and be like to my mum I didn't go to the gym today because of this and it's like I don't I don't need to justify it anymore I can just say you know I'm, I'm I'm good not going to the gym or and I think it's it makes a difference in your training as well because you know when you're so all or nothing your mood in relation to how your session goes is you know if you have a bad training session or you don't feel like you you didn't have the energy that you wanted to have or you didn't lift as well as you wanted to that can change your whole day in terms of your mindset and how you feel about yourself but now it's not a case of oh I I didn't do this or oh my weights were down from what they were last week it's kind of a well I'm in you know my luteal phase and maybe I'm a bit more tired maybe I didn't eat enough yesterday I'm not you know I'm not thinking oh this has ruined my day I'm thinking no I've had the opportunity to move my body I've had the opportunity to actually have the freedom of coming here I'm here in the first place like that's you know it doesn't need to be this massive thing in my head that I put loads of pressure on myself for it to be amazing it can just you know just be natural and it yeah it's so freeing now knowing that and not having the pressure and the mental arguments all the time um yeah and I I also like how you somewhat do a deload like unintentionally though before your period starts because that's one thing that we know is that the inflammatory markers of the body are up that week before the bleed occurs because it's trying to build lining that it will shed. So we have to be more inflamed in order for the body to do that. And again, it's a positive form of inflammation, but it's still inflammation. And if we're trying to go like PB, PB, PB during this time, like it's really not an efficient time to be doing it. That being said, if you're a competitor and there's a meet or something like that, you will have, you will be able to perform. There's no doubt about that. You will. But if you're, training whether it be recreationally or you're not in a comp prep of some sort it's actually the best thing to do for your body is to either take a week off and go for walks and pilates or just do modified movements or drills or to just take the week to do some walking Um, it's actually going to facilitate better training and influence a better physiological response by doing that Um, and I think when women start to get a lot more in tune with their symptoms around their cycle they start to notably observe that energy fluctuation where in the past it could have been seen as I'm not motivated. Why am I not motivated? Like, why am I getting the PB? Why am I energized? Where when you can be more in tune with yourself, it's like, no, this is actually the rhythm of my body. Like I know a couple of days before my period happens, I'm a bit wishy-washy or I know day two of my period, I'm actually really energetic or I feel really strong or around ovulation, I'm actually loaded with energy. I just want to be social. I don't even want to train. I just want to talk to people and have fun. And I think that's really empowering when we start to witness this natural flow that we've got. That's not a 24 hour rhythm. It's a 28, 30, 35, whatever your cycle is. And once you start to note those particular symptoms, you can actually use it almost like a superpower it's like oh well if I've gotten certain things on at work that I can tweak or manipulate where maybe I can be working from home versus in the office holding meetings and you can get really creative with it and start to um like put that structure into other areas of your life so that you're flourishing and Elisa Vitti has a really great book on it called In the Flow um which is all about that yeah in Freudian (laughs) rhythm and it's I'm still yet to I like I try and extract little bits and you know, added into my daily life. But I just remember reading it and being like, wow, that's exactly what happens. Like I do notice that I'm this sort of energy or I do notice that I want to be like this or maybe I'm more withdrawn or maybe I'm more social. It's not even training in energy. Sometimes it's just emotional responses. Yeah. And it's so fascinating how, and I mean, there's no reason for it not to be accurate, but when we've been living in this idea that it's what you can get done in 24 hours, or what's the 24-hour routine for someone to open it up to, well, what's your 30-day routine? It's like, what do you mean? What is this? Mm -hmm. And the way you describe things as they are at the moment, you seem to have adopted that where you've got a life rhythm versus like this 24-hour rinse and repeat. Yeah. Well, and the 24-hour rinse and repeat is based off men. 
all of the studies is it's all you know it's all based on men so you know it's going to be different for women and I think that's where as well even when you go back straight back to diet culture again all of the studies are based on men so we Mm. can't expect it to be the same for us because we've got so many differences especially with like the hormonal and menstrual so everything creates such a difference and I know that you know it's 24 hours for men and it's like you say 28 30 whatever days for women like it's not we don't work the same at all and so we can't base um our research and you know our knowledge of what is what works for a man because it's not going to work for a woman it's just it's just it's kind of we just need more research doing in that aspect so that we know and it is it is getting better it's getting so much better yeah so much better but (laughs) you know it's just still I think yeah it's just you kind of you forget because you just assume oh this study there's a study done and okay that's great it's good research but it's, you know, half and we've trusted know you know the top three google searches for so long if you think yeah. back to early days of health and fitness it's like best way to lose weight and you just click like the first mm-hmm. website or bodybuilding.com yeah. like the best workout or the best this or the best that and again you're just trusting some like author of an article really you don't even know if they're a nutritionist you don't know if they're a fertility specialist you don't know where the research is coming from we've just gone oh google has the answers so whatever they say goes um and you know even if you think about that it's a bit funny because it's like wow we're trusting like internet websites versus perhaps textbooks or or doctors or medical professionals like where is the source of some of this information and if they do reference case studies, have you ever thought to read the case studies? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes the case studies like 10 people. And it's like, that's not enough to say as a general yeah. rule, X, Y, Z occurs. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad that part has come up in the podcast because I hope that's something that women listening sort of dive into a little bit more when they're reading articles or information, like look at the references or look at what the case mm-hmm. studies are and then make a decision. Right, because some people are going to be happy with that. Others are going to go, oh, well, I probably want a little bit more. But either way, like own it. Know what information you're taking in and, and sort of be responsible for that versus yeah, just yeah. trusting everyone's got good intentions. Now, I can't believe we've been chatting for an hour. I've loved speaking with you. Now, I'm sure many of the listeners are going to want to reach out, connect with you, have a bit of a chat. Now, if anyone does want to do that, what's the best way to contact you? And if you want to drop your blog description, I'll pop all of this stuff in the show notes. But for now, if you could tell us where to go, that would be amazing. Yeah, so my Instagram is at underscore Emily O'Brien underscore. Uh, So if you wanted to message anything, then I'm so up for a chat <laughs> um and then my blog I think to be fair the, be- the best way to find my blog is you just search into google potato emily waffles it's a weird one I, I, I was gonna say I meant to bring it up earlier I... what's the inspo <laughs> behind it I so first year of uni I was absolutely obsessed with potato waffles I don't know if you know what they are they're mm-hmm. yeah like they're just they're they're waffles that are made of potato essentially and it's oh it's bizarre but I, I just I would have them after every night out and this is what I mean like the first year I was fine with food I had no like but also because I tend to like waff on and talk a lot and because of the blog I just thought okay I'll put my name in the middle and then it can be about Emily waffling on as well so I like puns and that's yeah it was a, it was a random one but it, that was where my mindset was at the time and it'll probably be one of those things like when you you know when you look back on old email addresses and you're like why did I do that oh but right we'll, we'll, we'll roll with it <laughs> that's what it is for now <laughs> That's awesome. No, very cool. I will put those details in the show notes, but thank you so much for joining us today and being so open and honest about your experiences and also being willing to share everything on the blog, because I do think the more conversations we have and the more open we are, the more that we can be the change, you know, so women don't have to go through what we do. Um, But no, thank you so much for your time and your energy. And I can't wait to speak to you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Emily is such a delight and it was so wonderful talking to her. Um, If you have enjoyed the episode, it would be great if you could like, subscribe or share it with someone else who would enjoy it. Um, It also helps support the channel so that we can, or podcasts that we can get out and be heard more by a bigger audience. So um, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you listening or watching and all of the conversations that we're having in between. And I can't wait to see you in the next one.